Rapper. How you doing today? How are y'all doing? I am your favorite rapper's favorite rapper, the best fair writer, director, St. Louis Facts, award-winning published author, activist, journalist, active business on the Lacey G. Soldier Turner. And today I have a special guest with me. Uh, she is currently represents the fifth 15 forward as Alder Woman in the city of St. Louis and is running to be the president of the board. We have the wonderful, amazing, talented Megan Aaliyah Green. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, no problem. So I saw that you spent almost a decade working in early childhood education and education period. Uh, could you tell me what made you choose that profession? You know, I think, uh, well, first of all, I come from a family of educators. My mom um, is a retired high school English teacher. My dad is a university professor. And I think, you know, an interest in education has always been a part of me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when I moved to St. Louis and I initially got involved um, as a Coro Fellow with a school called City Academy School, um, it became really clear to me that we needed to start earlier than we had been if we were going to make sure that kids were really prepared for um, elementary school and then you know setting them on the right trajectory for the rest of their lives and so um i uh i you know after that i i knew that a position had come open at lee may child and family center and um and i had a number of friends of mine who had worked there in the past and some folks that were on the board there and said, hey, this, you know, seems like this might be a good fit for you. Um, and so I got hired on there and, um, and spent a, you know, a good number of years working um, in the early childhood arena before then um, becoming the chief of data and communications for Child Care Aware of Missouri, um, who was doing more statewide advocacy work around early care and education. Okay. Did the kids drive you crazy? No, I love them. I love them. I mean, I little kids in particular, like they're just sponges, you know, yeah. they, they just like learn things so easily. And like the whole world is just so like eye opening to them. And they're so curious. So I just I, I love little kids. And I love all kids. But but there's a certain amount of wonder that comes with a little kid. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so that's previously that previously stated okay you're running for president of the board um you advanced from the special primary election and now you're on the ballot for the general election on november the 8th um and the position position you're running from was vacated by the last president uh who admitted to crimes that left the black eye and everything so what do you feel you can do to gain the trust of the people back from that like, I think there's a couple of things that we need to do right away. You know, one, we need to get the corruption out of our development system. And I think the way that we do that is through creating a citywide plan for development. So that instead of kind of coming to the alder person and the alder person negotiates, you know, what they want on behalf of the developer, you know, there's just set standards. So, you know, developers know if I'm going into this area of the city, I can qualify for this amount of incentive. Um, these are the public benefits that are going to be required with um, the project that I'm doing. And so we we take a lot of the kind of opaqueness out of the, the process that is there right now. Um, you know, the second thing we need to do is, is act more transparently as a body. Um, you know, the Board of Aldermen, I think any documents that we are getting to make decisions in, you know, committee hearings, the public needs to see those as well. They need to go up on the website. And something that I've done in the 15th Ward that has created, I think, trust amongst residents here is something called participatory budgeting, where, you know, every ward gets $300,000 a year for their ward capital budget. And what I've done with that budget is taken a portion of it um, and allowed residents to come forth with project proposals on how they want that money spent. And um, and then we take the top uh, 10 proposals up to the public to vote on. And so when the public votes on, you know, let's say putting in new lights and then new lights come in, they say, oh, well, you know, I government is doing what it said it was going to do. I voted for this, it's happening. And so I think that's a, it's a good way not to just like educate folks about how city government works and what these processes are, um, but it's also a good opportunity 
um, to, to help them, you know, regain some trust in city government by seeing us, you know, follow through with the things that they want us to do. Okay. And I also, <laughs> um, you know, crime is a very important thing, especially uh, St. Louis, you know, even more recently with the, you know, the shooting that happened at the Central Visual Performing Arts School. Um, if elected, what are some of your first actions on cracking down on crime? And how did you feel when that shooting happened? Yeah. Um, you know, first, the shooting was absolutely horrific. Um, I mean, I, I have a number of really close friends who send their kids there. It was you know, just outside of the ward that I represent right now. And a lot of my constituents have kids who, who attend that school. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is the more that we're learning about that situation, red flag laws could have potentially prevented it from happening. We, we know that the shooter had um, some history of some mental illness. We know that their parents had been trying to get a firearm out of the, the house and out of the possession of this individual because they were concerned that um, they were either suicidal or homicidal. And, um, and we didn't have any laws that allow law enforcement to get that weapon out of um, his hands, unfortunately. Um, and, and, you know, the thing that I find unconscionable about that is we are not allowed at the local level to pass any regulations on firearms. Um, the state legislature has taken that authority away from us, and they also um, will not pass any kind of sensible, um, you know, gun regulations. And so our, you know, our hands are tied in a lot of ways which means that we have to be looking beyond, you know, gun reform for what are things that we can do to, to address crime. And one of the things that I would really like to see us do is something called Operation Peacemaker. Um, this was a program that was done in Richmond, California, and Richmond used to be a lot like St. Louis in terms of um, pretty high homicide rates being known nationally for the, those homicide rates. They created this fellowship program where they went to folks that were at risk of committing gun crimes and basically said, what do you need to change the trajectory of your life? Because you're going to end up dead or you're going to kill someone. Um, and so they gave these folks a monthly stipend of, I think, $2,500 a month to cover basic living expenses. If they needed housing, they got them that. If they needed mental health care or an education or whatever, they got them that. And they found that in year one, their violent crime rates uh, reduced by uh, 33%. And over five years, um, they reduced by over 50%. And so, you know, that that is a model that I think we could easily incorporate here. I think it would work really nicely with what we have going on with cure violence so that, you know, after, a, you know, violence is interrupted and a conflict has been de-escalated, let's then see if we can get folks into a fellowship program like Operation Peacemaker and, and get them on a different trajectory um, so we can get to the, the root causes of crime and actually work to prevent crime from happening in the first place. Definitely. Yeah. And just to uh, stick with that a little bit, you mentioned mental illness. Um, you know, it's a lot of mental illness and homelessness. Uh, there's something that's going around St. Louis. A lot. It's been like that for years. Uh, what do you feel can be done about that, especially with the weather becoming cold? Yeah. I mean, the, the city has the resources, you know, because of the ARPA dollars, we have the resources for the first time in a long time. And we've put out several RFPs to, uh, you know, try to get community organizations to, um, to follow through with, with a number of proposals from a safe haven to some um, additional like walk in shelter space. I think um, the thing we need to, to work on is figuring out how do we help these organizations build the capacity that they need to be able to carry out these programs. So a lot of the challenges right now um, is that everybody is short staffed, right? It doesn't really matter what industry you're in. Um, and we know winter is coming. We need to get these shelters stood up in a in a fast manner. But we also that means we have to have the staff to be able to do it, right? And these yes, community yes. organizations have to have the staff um, to be able to make sure that that people have um, 
you know, the supports and the resources there that they need on site. And so I think as a as a city, we have to be working to, you know, hand in hand with our community partners to help them get the resources they need to be able to hire the staff that they need so we can, you know, open up a safe haven. We can be, um, you know, funding the full continuum of homeless services care from um, you know, folks who aren't quite ready to come inside all the way out to, you know, folks that are going to need permanent supportive housing um, for the long term. <clears throat> and also um, drug abuse, you know, that's a big thing here, especially with the fentanyl epidemic plaguing the streets, um, it's causing people to break in cars. What do you feel can be done about that? I mean, I, I think we need to do several things. One, we have to increase um, the capacity for treatment in the city. You know, a lot of folks, especially if they need outpatient treatment, are having to go to St. Charles or down to Farmington. And, you know, if you're lower income or you don't have insurance, the, you know, your ability to get inpatient treatment is, is even less. And so the city needs to be using some of the, the ARPA dollars that we have to stand up more um, treatment facilities across the city. I think we also need to look into um, creating a safe injection zone. Um, we have seen these be successful in other cities where it's a designated area or, you know, a designated building that people can go and they can use in a monitored and safe environment. So if they overdose, there are, you know, people that are there right away that can, that can, you know, tend medical care to them. There are counselors on, on staff that can be building relationships with people so that when they're finally ready to go into treatment or re ready to get help, those resources are right there um, but people can can use in a place where they know that they're not going to be criminalized because a lot of times when this behavior um, when addictive behavior gets pushed under the radar because people are afraid of being criminalized for their addiction that's when it it, it becomes the most unsafe and um, and so we have to be figuring out how to create a safe injection zone or, you know, similar type infrastructure that provides that safe place where we can um, connect folks with resources and save lives. And I was going to talk about that too, you know, the citizens, they feel like they be hearing the same stuff when it comes to the city services with the trash issues and the infrastructure improvements and uh, people speeding cars, killing people. Uh, what do you feel can be done about that? Because people say they keep hearing this same stuff and ain't nothing changing. Yeah. I mean, I I think we, I I think we're on the precipice of a lot of change. Mm -hmm. um, quite frankly, I I think you know, Mayor Jones has you know from day one wanted to change a lot of things, and change doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I think that we're we're on the right track especially when it comes to trash pickup and um and speeding cars or dangerous driving you know with, with trash pickup we have to get ourselves over to a universal dumpster system one of the things that folks don't realize is the city of st louis we have dumpsters that are proprietary they can only be picked up by our trucks and there's only one company in the entire country that manufactures the correct trucks to be able to pick up these dumpsters. So if we end up in a place where we don't have um, the number of trucks that we need or we don't have the workers that we need, we can't just go to a neighboring municipality and say, hey, could we borrow some trucks or we or could we borrow some workers? Because those trucks are not capable of picking up our dumpsters and workers who have not been trained on our dumpsters don't know how to use our trucks to pick them up. Um, but if we get over to a universal system, whether it's a roll cart system or or something like that, that should alleviate, I think, some of those those issues. And I believe that we're moving in that direction. You know, as far as, um, you know, speeding cars, the mayor just announced 40 million in ARPA dollars that is going to be going to implement already completed traffic studies. Um, you know, we've we've had all these traffic studies done across the city, but the challenge is um, we haven't had the funding to actually implement any of the recommendations. And so this is allowing us to move forward with a lot of those recommendations. And it's also helping us to realize that there are some areas of their city where we don't 
we haven't done studies where there there isn't good data um, and so we can direct resources there um, to ensure that we have a citywide plan for traffic calming um, and, and then with the infrastructure money that's coming in and the ARPA money that we have it, that gives us the ability to actually pay for the recommendations of these studies and get them implemented over the next few years. Um, I also know, saw that, you know, the S SLPS uh, cut a lot of the school bus services, which yeah. really hurt the children from keeping them from getting back and forth. <laughs> to, um, what do you feel can be done about that? I mean, I, I think the city's got to work with the school district in, um, in developing programs to attract and, and retain employees. Uh, you know, the, the challenge for everyone right now is that every sector is understaffed and um, and whether it's city government or, you know, school buses, which aren't under the purview of city government, we need to be doing things like, you know, providing down payment assistance or rental assistance for, for folks who come and work for us. You know, maybe student loan forgiveness up to a certain amount for people that come and work for us for a certain number of years or um, free child care. We know the, the cost of child care has been escalating and is keeping a lot of people out of the, the workforce altogether. So if we could um, invest in creating a robust early childhood network in this city, I think that gets more people back to work. It saves folks money and it might be a, a good reason for people to then come and work for the city or for the school district. Hey, I was going to touch on that too because I know when, when COVID hit, um, work changed for people like keeping them working at home or not even wanting to work at all um i know like a lot of the office spaces has not been rent especially downtown where i reside at right now so what do you think uh i guess can be done to try and regroup or rebuild these areas and get people back there I mean, I think specifically when we look at, at downtown, we have to recognize that the commercial real estate market has completely changed coming out of COVID. You know, so many employers have switched to either hybrid models or permanent work from home models, which means that we just don't need the amount of office space that we have historically had. What we do need, though, is housing. You know, there is a housing shortage across the board. Um, and there is particularly a housing shortage for uh, units that are at 60% or less uh, AMI. And so what I think we should be doing um, is working to build more housing downtown, you know, convert some of these office spaces that we've had um, over into housing to help fill that demand, make sure it's quality, affordable, something that's accessible to a lot of folks in the city. But I think that that will, um, that will help rebuild those areas while also filling uh, a pretty big need that we have in the city right now. Okay. And with the election vastly approaching for November 8th, what is it that you want the people to know about your opponent, Jack Cook? <laughs> You know, I, I think when you compare the two of us, um, it's really, you know, people versus special interests, right? You know, I have the support of, you know, almost 50 organizations, labor unions, elected officials. Like we have this huge coalition behind us. Um, and what he has is a lot of special interest money. And you see that come out in the way that he and I have historically made decisions. You know, I championed raising the minimum wage. He was opposed to raising the minimum wage. Um, I championed getting the, you know, $500 stimulus checks for folks that were impacted by the pandemic. He voted against that amendment. I um, was against privatizing our airport, which would have just given a huge payday to some big political donors. He was for it. Um, you know, over and over and over again, we've seen me fight for the public interest to make sure that big developers and big corporations are paying their fair share of taxes so that we have the resources that we need to provide good public services and to fund our public schools. And you've seen him, you know, over and over again, um, represent, representing these big developers and big corporations. And, um, and that's what he does for what he calls his real job. His, you know, real job is as a corporate attorney. And, um, and his law firm represents most of these big corporations and big developers in times. Um, and so he has a financial um, incentive to, to try to make these companies money. 
Um, and that's fine, but you should not be an elected off office using your elected office um, to make money for your clients. Okay. So why should the people vote for Megan Green? Because I want to build a St. Louis that works for everyone. You know, I we have to recognize that we've had areas of our city that have long had disinvestment and we finally have the resources to start to make that right to start to bring investment and reinvestment into areas that have long been neglected um, we have to be thinking more citywide um, and strategic about a lot of the issues that face us whether it be crime or you know speeding cars we have to actually address the root causes of crime instead of continuing to only invest in police, which show up after a crime is committed. Um, you know, we have to have a citywide plan for development, a citywide plan for streets, um, so that no matter what neighborhood you are living in, you have safe streets, you have good trash pickup, you have fair development policies which has not been the case in city government. So I, you know, I'm committed to, to, continuing to stand on the side of people and making sure that we build a St. Louis that works for everyone. Okay. And my last question that I like to ask all my guests, <laughs> when it is all said and done and you are long gone from this earth, what is it that you want the people to know about Megan Green? I think that I really care about kids. Um, you know, if they, I've been asked a couple times in the, the, you know, throughout this campaign, if there's something that I would like to be my legacy. Um, and if there's anything that I could have be my legacy, it would be the creation of a, a universal early childhood program for this city. Um, I think if we can invest in our kids from a young age, we can, you know, ensure that we are, are picking up on any developmental delays or lead poisoning or whatever it may be at a young age we're setting our kids up then for success into the future and you know those kids go on to then do better in elementary school and middle school and high school and go on to college and um and you you see the dividends pay out for our community right for every dollar you invest in early childhood community gets eleven dollars back in return on investment and um and so I think if, you know, after I'm off this earth, hopefully my legacy is that we have a robust early childhood program and, and folks can say Alderwoman Green helped get that done. And, um, and, and that will live on long past when I am no longer on this earth. Well, I thank you, Miss Maggie Green, for doing this interview, especially while you're sick. <laughs> You need Thank to take you. you need to take you some nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, achy stuff you have season <laughs> so you can rest better. Yes, <laughs> that is what I'm doing. I have my Gatorade, I have my tissues, and I'm going to, I think, go take a nap. And... Thank you. Well, I appreciate you, and I will definitely let you know uh, when we drop the article for you. Okay. Thank you. Right. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. All right. Bye. Bye.